we are recording. So welcome to Alistair and Matt. Thank you so much for joining us today for this. Um, can I ask you just to introduce yourselves and tell us what this whole spiritual activism thing is about, especially if anyone hasn't maybe finished the book. <laughs> Alistair, can we hear you? Your lips were moving, but, but I couldn't hear you then. We've lo I think Alistair is struggling there to, with, with sound. Yeah. Oh, you're still on mute, Alistair. <laughs> off no, to crack and you're start. Turning it on and off, and nothing's happening. So while Alistair, while Alistair just sorts that out, um, I'll, I'll just introduce myself and say a little bit about the book. So this is it. This is the book, if you haven't seen it, Spiritual Activism, Subtitle Leadership as Service. I'm Matt Carmichael. Um, I live in Leeds. And, um, you know, uh, this book came about um, because Alistair had taught a course. Um, as, um, um, oh, is it working now? Are we there, Alistair? No, I'll... There we go. Oh yes, I'm working. Okay. Here you now. Yeah, great. So Alistair had taught a course and written a handbook for it to get accreditation for the course um, for a group of postgrads, and um, the, the course was entitled Spiritual Activism, and that handbook was full of really fantastic materials and thoughts and ideas, and Alistair wanted to make it available for a wider audience. So that's where I got involved and helped to um, put, you know, make it into a form that would be, you know, would make a good book um, that didn't require Alistair in the room to guide things along. And that for me was a great privilege um, to be able to work alongside Alistair like that, to read a lot of his background reading, to really wrestle with all these um, concepts and ideas because I needed at that point um, some sort of intellectual process to uh, go alongside my spiritual um, development and the activism that I was involved with for many work for many years and still am so um, I learned a huge amount from 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 that process and it's you know it's shaped my work and my character I think um ever since um so yeah I, i'll stop there because alistair if you want you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself have you <laughs> oh and we're struggling again no sorry alistair still can't hear you at the moment can you hear me now? Oh, yes, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if I go to um, this one, can you still hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. I seem to have an intermittent problem. I'm so sorry about that, folks. So basically, um, I've been teaching what I came to think of as spiritual activism since the 1990s, initially in Edinburgh University, then elsewhere. And Matt described how he took my teaching notes and basically pulled it into a more palatable form, a less academic form um, in, in this book here. And what we've tried to do in this book is we've tried to give a guide, not just for activists, i.e. people who are active for social, environmental and spiritual change in the world, not just for activists to be more effective in how they do their work or do our work, but also in terms of helping people to rethink the relevance of spirituality in these times. And I know that a number of you here are involved in ministry in one form or another. A central question as we move into the third millennium of Christianity is what's it got to say to the world? What is its relevance to the world today? And that's why in the book, we start off in the first chapter looking at what activism is and why, when we are up against it, we may get moved to situations of saying, God help me, God carry me. We may, we may find we have to reach more deeply, but also 
as I will show when I share some slides with you in at a suitable time, it can be a very effective way of communicating to other people, even in most unexpected contexts. However, if you're going to talk about spirituality, especially in a secular world, you need to have some basis for doing it. You know, are you just inventing it? Is it just um, fairyland? Is it just um, what you want it to be? Or are we talking about an actual reality? Is God for real? Is the spirit for real? Does Christ have real meaning? Now, Matt and I are coming at this book from a very interfaith context, as you will see in it. We weave in Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, um, even kind of earth-centered spiritualities. But I'm going to put the focus today on the Christian, because I think that what the cross has to say to the world today is powerfully important. That really unpacks when you get into the non-violence of it. But because the question of what is spirituality is so important, is it valid? That's why our second chapter is called Spirituality Justified. And that looks at the kind of research that's going on, you know, research into mystical experience. There is a long history of that, going back to um, the Canadian psychiatrist Raymond Buke's book, from around 1900, Cosmic Consciousness. Uh, Buke um, was a uh, contemporary, was Edmund Diller Starbuck. Is that focusing or is it maybe not? Um, the Psychology of Religion, Starbuck there, which William James drew upon in his um, classic study. I've not got it here, it's downstairs. In his classic study, of religious experience. So basically at the turn of the, at the start of the 20th century, you had that explosion of research into the fact that people actually had spiritual experiences. Buke describes when he was over in England, driving home in a horse-drawn cab, and the Brahmanic splendor, the, the splendor as described by the Brahmans in the Hindu scriptures, just opened up within him. He had this incredible vision and experience of God. And that was what led him to research this, such experiences in literature and then drawing on the research that other people were doing around that time. So if you like, there is an evidence base there. That evidence base is what is studied <laughs> um, in transpersonal psychology. And you know, there is the Rutledge International Handbook Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. The transpersonal psychology one is downstairs, but here's another one that Matt and I have got a chapter about spiritual activism in the Rutledge International Handbook of Spirituality in Society and the Professions. I mean, sadly, these you know, books like this are crazy academic prices. What does it matter? 140 quid or something like that. It uh, started out £600. It's, it's, it's totally, yeah. you can only really... <laughs> get it to a library. We've got copies because we contributed a chapter in it. But the point I'm making is that there is a field of study here. It's a field of study that in schools of theology tend not, tends to be ignored. Uh, they tend to assume you just go on faith. And faith is all very well if you're coming from a background or an experience where you've got that. But if you've not got it, the question, you know, is there any foundation for belief? that there's more to life than just being eagles walking about on legs. And so we move on into that, to looking at consciousness, because all experience comes through consciousness, including the higher consciousness of varying levels of God consciousness, the structure of the psyche, a union of what it means to be a human, movements and their movers, which is a chapter about prophetic calling. We think of the prophetic belonging to biblical, but in fact, I mean, here, where is it? Behind me here. Um, I just took delivery of this the other day, Cornell West, Black Prophetic Fire. Um, my, in my internet went unstable for a moment, so that's why I just stopped for a moment there. Black Prophetic Fire. Uh, you've also got 
similar, where is he, James Cohn, somewhere sitting around, or was sitting around in the, um, you, you, you know, you've got particularly from marginalized group, indigenous people, people of color, um, you, you've, the whole black theology area, you, you've got that side of things coming in and saying that what Jesus was on about is as relevant then as now. We move into understanding cults and charisma. That's a really important chapter because we are working with charisma when we work with the spirit. Um, the, the charism is a gift, the gifts of the spirit. We're working with charisma, but charisma easily goes wrong. So we need understandings, we need structures of how that can happen. And in our view, it's irresponsible to work with spirituality unless we familiarize ourselves with the social psychology and the history surrounding what can go both wrong and right with that. We have a chapter on nonviolence. Um, my view is that in third millennium Christianity, nonviolence needs to become the predominant thing, that the cross absorbs the violence of the world. I see the words violence and sin as being interchangeable. I'm taking my lead there from the liberation theologian Gustavo Gutierrez, who defines sin as the breaking of friendship with God and with other human beings. And so I find it helpful. You know, it's off-putting if you go into the world and you start talking about everybody being sinners. But if you start talking about we're all complicit with structures of violence, that gets a different kind of traction. And so um, we move into tools for discernment um, using Quaker approaches like meetings for clearness, meditative approaches to deepen contemplative spirituality, and thereby into the deeper magic that, in a sense, in um, C.S. Lewis's sense, and the Narnia Chronicles, where he talks about the deep magic set in place when time began. This leads us into that cosmic process of understanding that as human beings, we are moving not just in this present moment, but that that present moment is grounded in all of eternity. And that the expansion of spiritual consciousness is to progressively widen our understanding of how our lives are held, to see that we are held in a cosmic hand, we are held in the cosmic basket. And that is the fullness of our reality. And why Jesu I walk through the valley of the shadow of, the death, of death, I shall fear none ill, for thou art with me, with thy rod, with thy symbol of power, the mace and staff, with the staff that leads the way. Thou art with me, with thy rod and staff, me comfort still. So I've set that in a very Judeo-Christian context there. Um, I could equally have set it in Hindu or um, even an Islamic context, which I do when I'm working in a country like Indonesia. Um, but in this context, I'm setting it in that Christian context and a call to deepen what our tradition has to offer in the world today. Thanks, Alistair. Danielle, where, where, where are we up to? Where we <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, we're still kind of in the introductory session yeah. before we get into the breakout groups, but I wonder, um, for those who don't know you, you folks as well, um, it, it might be just helpful to hear just a couple of minutes from each of you about your activism and how personally this has impacted the way that you approach um, your activism. Yeah. Um, so my, I, I've been sort of um, involved in various kinds of social, environmental, peace activism for most of my life, really, you know, I've got my um, red letter Bible here, right? This was given to me by my uh, godmother, Val, my mum's best friend who passed away a couple of years ago. And 
she prayed for me every day of my life for 46 years and um, of her life, I should say, until she died. So this was my background, my evangelical background, which was very much a, um, a place where, um, you know, the teachings of Jesus were, were in, the, in, the, in the best way possible. People tried to put them into practice, right, in, in their best understanding. And this was a place where um, love in action could be costly. Uh, my parents were missionaries, medical missionaries in Tanzania. They gave up large chunks of their life. They never had any career ambitions for themselves. Our house was always full of um, people from all over the world, often from very, very poor uh, backgrounds, who came through telling extraordinary stories of, of their activism. I particularly remember one man who was a diplomat in um, Kenya, and I remember him telling us how in apartheid South Africa he'd been sent on a diplomatic mission and been given a document that made him an honorary white man. <laughs> and this allowed him on public transport <laughs> and allowed him to get into the buildings where he had to have his meetings. Um, so this this was all, uh, you know, this was my life growing up. Um, I went, I was the kind of, you know, teenager, I'm sure a lot of you would identify with who had a, a Bible where I would, you know, I would try to, you know, highlight the, you know, the bits that I thought. And after a while, you know, there was nothing that wasn't really highlighted. So um, I thought the red letter <laughs> was a really good idea because this was probably the bits that should be highlighted. Um, and um, I went to university, I studied theology, and I started to become aware of real problems with my own tradition uh, and my own background and a sense of, you know, um, dishonesty, a bit of naivety. And I started to move away from my Christian background, um, getting more and more involved in activism. So the sorts of activism at that point were um, the um, Reclaim the Street campaign, the uh, anti-roads protests in the 90s. Um, but uh, through all of this, I, I knew I, you know, I knew that, that my faith had offered me something and had provided something that, that I missed and that I needed. And I was still having experiences of just how real the, you know, Christian faith was at its core. So I remember a friend of mine uh, one day phoning me up in a panic. I came home from a, a short break away actually, and there were 24 messages on my answer phone uh, from this friend, uh, Mick, and something strange had happened. He, he was in a bit of a panic. So I, I went over to his house, he only lived a few yards away. I said, Mick, what on earth has happened? He said, come in, Mark, come in, Mark. I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I need to tell you, and I don't think anybody else would get it. He described to me, um, kneeling by his bed, he'd, he'd recently met um, a lovely young lady who eventually became his wife. She was a Christian and he wasn't. This had become like a thing in their relationship. They had to work this out. He'd knelt by his bed as he did as a child and invited uh, Jesus into his heart. And his body was filled with a warmth spreading outwards from his heart. He felt for the next three days that he was walking on air as he went down this, just going about normal life. And this was accompanied by terrifying nightmares um, of hideous kind of torture and um, evil. And then he sort of, you know, came out of this. Um, so, you know, I, I was at this point calling myself an atheist, you know, <laughs> and, and here's this guy. And I said, right, Mick, um, well, the only language I've got, the only way I can describe is you were, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And this kind of experience is accompanied sometimes with this kind of shadow side. Um, and we know, we, we talked about that. But so at a moment when I was thinking of myself, you know, it's entirely outside religion and, and spirituality. Here was an experience of absolutely concrete experience from, I must say, probably the most straightforwardly honest man I've ever come across, possibly with the exception of Alistair. Um, 
And, you know, there's no doubt about this was real at all in my mind. So what do you do with this? You know, you're going around calling yourself an atheist and, you, um, and you're, you're deeply involved in, in uh, activist work. So I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to square these circles and I read loads and I talked to people. Um, but it wasn't really for another 15 years until I met Alistair and started reading his work that all the very sort of different kind of things I knew and, and recognized as real started to be able to come together in some way that made some kind of sense to me. Until then I was having to hold it all in tension and accept that things I couldn't reconcile, reconcile were, were, were sort of real. But the way Alistair uh, frames things um, allows a lot of these tensions to be resolved in some way around, for me, this idea of spiritual activism, which, you know, it's, it's evolved. But now I would define spiritual activism as living the most loving truth. This is how I try to sum it up, living the most loving truth. Um, and the, the slight risk of embarrassing Alistair, you know, one of the benefits for me of, of being involved in writing this book was actually meeting Alistair and getting to talk to him and be in um, workshops like this and uh, promoting the book and so forth. And in all my encounters with, with Alistair, he is able to, to be extremely truthful and honest and direct with a kind of integrity about himself without denying the, the, uh, the realities of the situation that we're in, the person. He pays great attention to the to people that we're with. And he always finds a way to reconcile these things. Um, and I think it's years and years of practice, but he speaks to people with that loving truth. He uh, looks for opportunities to express it in practical ways, to serve people. And to me, actually seeing how Alistair works uh, and how he lives kind of reflected back into my understanding of our own work in the book. And I realized how much emphasis there is there on this kind of deep psychological honesty that is needed if you're going to be an activist in a way that fully embraces all the many te tensions that are involved with that. A deep psychological honesty with yourself, with the people you're working with, and often with your opponents who we might call enemies. So we, we have to have that deep psychological honesty if our activism is going to remain true to reality and make any kind of long lasting difference in people's lives. Otherwise we will find that our work um, lacks any depth and, and, and its consequences, even if they're good, won't last. Okay. Thank you, Matt, that's really powerful. I think, um, I think what we'll do is we're gonna break up into um, breakout rooms and just take a moment to to kind of introduce one another and the questions are basically um if you've read the book what did you get out of reading it the first time or what are your reflections on what we shared already today and then what are you hoping to get out of this time of discussion and um and then we'll that'll just, we'll just take about 10 minutes to do that in small groups and then um we will come back and feed feed that back and it will um you know inform some, the rest of today. I, um, the, your small groups won't be recorded, so don't worry about that. Um, I'm just going to open up the rooms. Let me just, and you can join when you're ready. Alistair and Matt, I haven't put you in a room, but would you like to be in one? Perhaps with each other, would that be okay? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And, well, and you, I'll just leave us in the main better. session. <laughs> well, with, with you as well, Daniel, if you yeah, like. Yeah. You reflect on how it's going and what, where we want to go next. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. 
Right, Alistair, we've lost you again, I'm afraid. We, I can't hear you. Okay. John, have you managed, Churcher, have you, have you managed yeah. to figure out how to... That's me back. Oh. That's me back, yeah. Um, I don't know what's going on. The, I'm sorry about that. Um, just you know, one thing is that I've got um, I've got um, a sequence of slides that I can sort of show of activism in process. If if it's appropriate to bring that in at some point, mm -hmm. so that yeah, we actually ground it and what it looks like, including the theological dynamics of it. I'm using the super quarry and the Gal Gale. Awesome. In, yeah. in that, so uh, I would go through those very quickly. It would probably take about ten minutes. 12 minutes to well, run through them. Okay. Um, so just f feed that in, Danielle, when you think is appropriate. Um, thank you for that overly flattering introduction. It's funny, it's the first time I've sort of articulated that with you in the room. I'll need to cut before. out that little segment of the recording <laughs> and send it to Viren, my wife. <laughs> Hello, Naomi. Oh, I just realised we're still recording this bit. I'm going to pause us. <laughs> Okay. Where's everybody? Yeah, I looked on the one minute. Working. Oh, they're still. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Still <laughs> <laughs> it, it usually takes a minute to close down the breakdown. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here they come. Sorry. Welcome back. Welcome, folks. <laughs> I think what we're going to do, since we are actually a, a small enough group, is we'll abandon the breakout rooms and just kind of have some more group discussion as we as we feel led. But it would be great just to have, if whoever's comfortable, there's no pressure to to do that. Uh, any feedback from your conversations about um, what you learned, what you're thinking about, what you're hoping to get out of these discussions today? You just feel free to pipe in. Well, our, our little group was a group of two. <laughs> <laughs> Who were you? Uh, Who are you with? Uh, with Kathy. Lovely. <laughs> relaxed, relaxed Kathy. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, actually, uh, well, bo both of us, we, we have not read the book, okay? Yeah. But, uh, but the title alone was intriguing enough for me to join. Brilliant. Yeah, because I said it combines two areas of interest. I'm repeating what I said to Kathy: uh, right. the spirituality and activism, right. as well. And uh, I was heartened by the introductory comments, not just because uh, Alistair quoted uh, Cornell West and James Cone, mm -hmm. you know, Black theology, liberation theology. Because again, I'm, I'm enjoying that. But but <laughs> some of the comments that he made that gave me a bit of hope as well. And I said to Kathy, what what I'm hoping to get out of today is maybe some strategies on how to be a better activist, if there is such a thing, um, but also a bit of courage to go back into some of the spaces where I am, I am in, and I'm in at the moment and trying to get people to engage with some of the topics that need engaging with, you know, whether it's racism, whether it is, you know, um, uh, climate change, uh, sexism, whatever it is as well. And, and both Kathy and I agreed, we, we just, that expression, seeing, um, uh, violence or sin and using that concept or framework to engage with people thought yeah like that you know it's a way in and I said to Kathy uh, when you say sin to people they think about their diet and what they can can and can't eat they don't think about the violence aspect of it so yeah so thank you yes that's my comments lovely thanks <laughs> great Kathy, did you want to add anything from your conversation? I think David's just given a fabulous summary. Yeah. The other thing is that we found out we're both troublemakers. <laughs> so I quite enjoyed that. Um, and yeah. we're good company listening. then. Sorry? <laughs> You're a good company then. Yeah. Um, and so I think David was saying he was looking for stories of kind of hope and courage from this as well and I was also looking at healthy ways to deal with anger as well I think because this when you're doing activism things you can become um quite overwhelmed I think sometimes so it's the contemplative and spiritual side is really important as a balance I really love Richard Rohr 
um for that like I just adore him that's how I start every day yeah. but um just that balance of like the anger is a good emotion to drive us towards knowing something's unjust and wrong but not having it overwhelm you is what I would really like to find out <laughs> yeah <laughs> great thank you those are lots of lovely thoughts to yeah good explore mm. there how about others how have your other conversations gone Phil, were you about to speak then, Phil? I can't. Yeah, hear yeah, yeah. I, yeah. If nobody yeah. else from the group will, I, I mean, I, I think none, none of us have read the book, so apologies for that. I, oh, I get a, um, a newsletter um, through email from the Passionists, you know, the the, the Roman Catholic Order, and um, it, I, I saw this event just about an hour ago, so I've kind of just kind of well, come in, but I, I'm kind of, I've, I suppose, I've been involved with kind of some some form of activism. activism um, since I was kind of, I suppose, in my teens, I suppose. But I, I currently chair. Um, there's a. I'm part of Hexham and Newcastle, the Catholic Diocese, and I chair the, the the Justice and Peace Coordinating Council there. So we we've got um, a couple of kind of projects um, working with people who are seeking asylum, refugees, and so we do a lot of campaigning around those issues. I'm currently campaigning against a um, proposal for a detention centre in Medhamsley near near concert. So, but campaign on kind of environmentally as well at the, at the minute you know, we've got um we're trying to you know be working to try to get the diocese to divest from fossil fuels and the bishop set up an environmental working group which is really good that um and we've got a few other sort of you know th things going on but i think i think everybody you know that you know on the council is, is kind of motivated by their faith i guess and um yeah i mean I just, I'm just kind of interested in lots of things that have been said already, but the mysticism thing, I'm particularly kind of interested in, but also the anger thing. And, you know, how do you, how do you work in a way where you don't become, you know, I've got a conservative MP for the first time and I just got a letter from me yesterday about this detention centre and it's, uh, it's, it's easy to get angry and uh, to, kind of, you, you know, to take, to personally dislike, isn't it? Um, but it's, it's kind of, you've got to be bigger than that, I think. And, uh, and how do you how do you you know um, I suppose you know like retain your activism retain your gospel values that every human being is valuable and you know people have got to be loved how do you reach out to people who oppose you? Yeah, I think I'm going to echo. Sorry, Bill. I'm going to echo Phil's story like when I was um, uh, you know, as a, a young a young teenager. I was a teenager. I've been, I've been involved in um, various. Um, Guys of politics. I mean, I protested everywhere and chained myself to various bits and bobs and lie down the road and whatever. And uh, I've been involved in like practically every movement going. Um, Faz Lane and all sorts of stuff. Um, but the um, uh, but I was really heartened about this. Um, uh, you know, I do think actions not that not that actions do speak with words. But we can't be theoretical about our faith. We got, we got to be practical. Um, so that's why I mean I'm drawn to chaplaincy ministry. So I do a bit of work in hospitals. I do a bit of work in prisons. Um, I'm a street pastor. I do rail pastoring. Um, uh, you know I work with adults with learning disabilities. Um, I was uh, found founding a trustee member of a homeless charity. Um, so I have to have to have some tangible results. You know, like uh, I, mean, I, 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 I love the idea of creating space for people to find God, um, but at the heart is actually wanting to make a difference in people's lives, um, and 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 not to be theoretical, but to get your hands dirty. Um, you know, and so you know, I'm, I'm I'm always prepared to roll up my sleeves and get stuck in. And I think it's, it's interesting the role I have as a vicar that people think like. Even nowadays, people still to want to put you on a, on a pedestal, um, where I'm more like, you know, I'm, I'm, one, I'm one of the workers and uh, prefer to be like, you know, <laughs> down, in the, down in the dirt rather than like, you know, in an ivory tower. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Is, it, who, is anybody else who'd like to? Chip in, tell us what you were talking about in your breakouts.
Here's uh, Liz. Sorry, I'm on my phone. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I, I can only see one person at a time. Um, yeah, I just feel I've been in XR and climate activism for the last three years, and I just feel like we're not really going to influence sort of our faith communities in sort of taking the next sort of step in terms of sort of, you know, revolutionary love and care for others in creation unless we do address sort of people's yeah as you said the like inner psychology and spirituality side of it because yeah I feel like sometimes I'm quite busy doing nothing and sort of see people at edge of burnout and I just think actually yeah you need both both at the same time and that's yeah that's what I that's why I really wanted to join I'm mm. probably not making a lot of sense but um yeah after sort of doing it for three years I really believe that yeah we need to sort of as a part of outreach to get more people involved if you don't look at people's yeah inner sort of motivations and the step taking care of their own sort of spirituality then it wouldn't be right you know that you need that as part of your activism and also it's not just the obvious activism like I'm sort of part of a community alliance where we're trying to draw all the different groups together food banks homelessness uh black lives matter friends of the earth and actually there so many of them are activists they just don't think they are yeah, yeah. um so it's just trying to yeah join everyone together in revolutionary love is <laughs> a phrase I've got from Brian McLaren's last book <laughs> so yeah Thank you so much for your thoughts at the beginning. It's really helpful. Thanks, Liz. Fab. Can I just ask where you are, Liz? I'm in Exeter. But yeah, sorry, I, I'm moving around because I actually am meant to be packing to go away to North Devon and we're meant to be leaving soon, but I don't want to miss this morning. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just going to turn my video off um, now. Okay. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Joel, Sharon, uh, you haven't said anything yet, and no, no pressure, but if you would like to, don't miss the chance. <laughs> Just happy to crack on, it's fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Smashing. Joel's actually my husband, and he's, oh, I think he's yeah, watching Joel. our children at, <laughs> while he's listening. So, <laughs> okay, brilliant. <laughs> Fab. Well, that's that's brilliant. So many interesting thoughts, concerns, and I tell you what's really lovely, actually, uh, hearing from all of you there. Is it, it sounds very much like you all really are very strongly engaged in activism. You know, Alistair and I, you know, we've 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 had interesting experiences with groups drawn to spiritual activism events who, who aren't really doing much in the way of activism sometimes but you guys you're really getting stuck in to the big issues and the you know uh, uh, and, and the compassionate life so well done to all of you um, it's really lovely to hear about the things you're you're doing Alistair, would this be the moment perhaps to use your slides? It might be. Um, and I can just, what I've done folks is I've prepared some slides that will um, just give you visual images for some of the things that you may have read me in, in, in various books discussing um, about activism. Can you see that okay? Is that yeah. Is that showing okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, um, so you know, the main books where I'm discussing this is Soil and Soul, in which the story I'm just going to tell you is the super quarry is documented, spiritual activism, which we're talking about today. And also, if you're looking for the more contemplative dynamics of deep activism, 
uh, Porter's Pilgrimage, which is about a 12-day walk I made through the Hebrides, reflecting, especially on the work I do with military staff colleges. And I'm just going to very, very quickly, because some of you will have already read the story, and it's really the spirituality of it I want to draw out. I'm going to summarize for you um, a, a couple of areas of work. What, one is a campaign that prevented this mountain from being turned into the world's largest stone roadstone quarry in the world. And the other is urban work here in governing Glasgow, where I'm based. So basically in the 1990s, there was a proposal um, to turn this mountain in a national scenic area of Scotland into this massive quarry for building motorways. Um, you can see here how the quarry master has lowered the village sign and twisted it round to suit his convenience, a sense of the corporation could come in and take control of a place. And it's a, a beautiful mountain in a historic area. That's St. Clement's medieval church there, built on a site that local tradition says goes back to the Druids. And this was how the quarry company represented it. Uh, you can see the comparison there. Um, you can see how you know, they try to make out the impact would be relatively minimal as they scooped the belly out of this mountain. And basically, we did all the conventional campaigning and what have you. Um, none of that, the economics or anything, the ecology, the sociology, was going deep enough to bring about shifts in opinion and to try and stop this thing. And then I started, you know, connecting in with these kind of shamanic understandings for which you could say in a biblical context, prophetic understandings of it. Uh, various artists did the same, making artistic statements about the value of the mountain. So the importance of the arts and spirituality here. And then I found myself being drawn more and more deeply into the spirituality of, of the prophets, basically, what they were doing. Just read that. I won't read it to you. Read that quotation from Brueggemann there. That new poetic imagination evoked new realities in the community. And that quote from Isaiah, do not remember former things, behold, I am doing a new thing. And so to me, the deeper aspects of spiritual activism, you're not just using it as a tool. When our friend there was talking about XR and how spirituality sits like that in my latest book, um, Riders in the Storm, about climate change here, um, that cover will be changing shortly when they reprint it, but it'll still be the same book. Um, in, in, in my latest book, I have a chapter on um, rebellion and leadership in climate movements and suggest that we have to be careful not to use our activism in a merely instrumentalist way because it works. A, a lot of the stuff about nonviolence, um, for example, um, Chenoweth and Stefan here, um, why civil resistance works. There's not a mention of spirituality in it. So they're basically using spiritual techniques, but without acknowledging the, the grounding of them. And Alistair, we've lost your microphone. Still can't hear you. Oh, there you go. Am I back? Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Did, was I lost for long, Daniel? Just for a second. Just for a second, yeah. I must have something wrong with my cabling here. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I do is I constantly try to call it back down to the, to the God-centeredness of it. I think if we lose the God-centeredness of it, and, and this is when non-theist approaches or secular approaches to the spiritual, I, I think are quite problematic. 
and we lose the wellsprings of that poetic imagination that evokes new realities and community. So a lot of my work's been very shaped by Walter Wink here, the late Walter Wink, um, who contextualizes Christian theology um, like Adolfo Perry's Esquivel in his Stations of the Cross that I'm using the images of here, contextualizes in the modern world. So images like this, if you, if you Google liberation theology, Stations of the Cross, you'll get these up because I put all 15 of these images on the web. Um, they were distributed by the Catholic churches in 1992. And then when Ratzinger came in, um, they, they kind of did completely disappeared. And I had a complete set because I'd been on the board of the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund. I'm a Quaker, but they had a, a non-Catholic on at that time. And that's how I, I got my hands on them. So I digitized them. Um, Wink talks about the need to name the powers, to name the reality of power, to name what power does, how it, that it oppresses, that, that it suppresses the spirit that it leads to injustice, it's, or can lead to injustice. Then we can unmask the powers that be, we can reveal how they do that, and only then can we engage the powers that be that he sees as a non-violent process of calling power back to a higher God-given vocation. So note the powers are good, but they're fallen and so they must be redeemed. Uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, the um, so-called father of liberation theology, and, and I see in his work three levels, social level, liberation from social situations of oppression and marginalization, and a lot of people see it as no deeper than that, which is a problem. Um, that's when you end up with a criticism that liberation theology can be just about priests with guns, because it's not taking it deeper. Um, you have the psychological level also. Gutierrez calls it a personal transformation by which we live with profound inner freedom in the face of every kind of servitude. That's just so important, especially if we find ourselves suffering in the course of our activism. And then the spiritual liberation, and here you get that definition I used earlier, liberation from sin, which attacks the deepest root of all servitude for sin, violence is the breaking of friendship with God and with other human beings. And this wonderful thing here, uh, based on John 10.10, 10, to liberate is to give life. I, I come not that they might have any old God-forsaken life, but that they might have promised life abundantly, John 10.10, 10, if I might expand it a little bit. And so the basis, the gospel basis of liberation theology is this well-known passage. And there you see the spirituality, profound interconnection. You know, what is the spiritual? To me, it is about this profound interconnection that we are members one of another, branches in the vine of life. We're all Buddha nature. The Atman, the individual soul, is Brahman, universal soul. The rainforest being stripped of its garments, Christ being stripped of his garments, Chico Mendes, the murdered Brazilian, rubber tappers, trade union leader. You see the power of just matching these images or images like these with pithy quotes like this to deepen people's reflection. So I will use these, you know, in my talks, I'll use them in secular context. And my goodness, you feel the room go silent. What a critique of consumerism this is. I use that a lot in work with climate change and the consumerism that drives it, that we're living out of cracked systems. And we need to find the real living water. It's a world itself that's crucified. The crucifixion is an ongoing reality. The resurrection is an ongoing reality. This weekend, I think, is the, is that the Orthodox Sunday this weekend? Is that, what, sorry, the Orthodox Easter, is that what's going on this weekend? I'm seeing a lot of images like this on Twitter from Orthodox theologians just now. They've obviously got something big going on. I think it's maybe their Easter. And this preferential 
you know, liberation theology, the preferential option for the poor, to preach good news to the poor, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the jubilee, the, the redistribution of land, the cancelling of debts, etc. And so in the case of the super quarry, one of you in the chat asked about indigenous and Aboriginal points of view. Um, what I did in order to activate, how do you activate the spiritual? What I did was, um, to cut a long story short, it's all in soil and soul. Um, I brought in an, a Native American warrior chief, Sulian Stone Eagle from Nova Scotia. He'd stopped a similar quarry. And also the professor of theology in the Free Church College, Donald McLeod. And the three of us asked to give testimony together in the government public inquiry into the super quarry. And you can imagine the media went crazy over this, as you can see in these headlines. And sometimes you've got to la let them laugh at you in order to open up the conversation. And that's what happened. It got, it got people thinking more, they laughed and then they thought more deeply. And to cut a long story short, was many other players, not just what I was doing here, um, public opinion reversed on the super quarry um, and the whole thing started to fall apart. Redland, the English company behind it, got taken over by the French Lafarge. We were now dealing with these people in Paris. Uh, here's three of the vice presidents of Lafarge. I went to see them and they said, well, we need to come and see. So they came to the island. I took them around to meet the community. And I said, what is this going to do to your reputation? You have a good reputation in France. You wouldn't do this in a French national park. Why are you doing it here? So they went back to Paris. And to cut a long story short, and this is in the Lafarge boardroom here, um, they pulled out. Um, and that is a contribution I made. I'm cutting a long story short to one of their reports by which we persuaded them to finally recognize the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, amongst a number of other things. And I just want to now ground that because the, the problem when I tell a story like that is it's so big, you know, a mountain or land reform and egg. Let's bring it now down to the micro. Uh, because one of the figures, as you know, was Stone Eagle here. At the time, there were the motorway protest going on in Glasgow at the Pollock Free State. So he went and helped to stir things up there a bit, deepening things um, in Glasgow here, where I am just now. And arising out of that, we founded the Galgill Trust, which uses traditional arts and crafts, especially boat building, to reconnect people in urban poverty with deeper meanings of life. Eldership, the importance of that. Our workshop here, obviously been closed because of COVID, but um, starting to open up again now. Reconnecting people with beauty and so many people, you know, there is a natural hunger for the spiritual and it's there in the symbols, it's there in the signs, it's, it's there in the image of the boat and the voyage of life. And so we go out onto the river and perhaps raise the sail and normally once a year, we've not been able to the last year because of COVID, I'll take a group of a couple of dozen up to Iona. And we won't stay at the Abbey because it, it's too middle class. It's too, I mean, we had a connection there one year. It was a total disaster because it was just so middle class and our people felt deeply uncomfortable. Um, but now we found another way of having connection there. Um, <laughs> We do our stuff on the beach. And we also go to the Abbey, but on our own terms. And, you know, our folk, so many, I can't say so many, I say some of them, just have deep experience, deep inner experience there. And as a prank they played on me, I went in to see the um, island's director. And while I was in there, they all got together around the table here and replayed the Last Supper just to play a prank on me. <laughs> and yet, you know, it's a prank, but yet it's so grounded. You know, that is the Last Supper. The, these are the people 
of the Last Supper. And, and the point that I'm making here is that our activism can be very grounded things in the community. It can be working on very simple things like, like an outing where you invite people or you bring people into a context of pilgrimage, which is basically what that is, that opens up a deeper reflection on life and its meaning and brings meaning in where there was meaninglessness. And, and to me, that's a really critical aspect of it. So my work gets known because of the big things, but it's actually got its grounding in these little things. And I would think that many of you in your own work, your own ministry, your own voluntary organization, so on, will probably recognize what I've just been saying there. And, you know, Jesus did so many of his healings and then he'd say, you know, away you go and don't tell anybody. In other words, no, no big song and dance needed about it. Um, he knew that the real spiritual work happens in these one-to-one -one small group ways. And to me, that's part of the reason why we need that message today. We need that, you know, I, I often think, you know, Krishna was a god who incarnated and had a wonderful time amongst the gopi girls in his youth. And the Buddha was a prince who grew up in a palace until one day he went out and saw suffering and went and sat beneath the tree and received enlightenment. And then he went and made the, the Sangha, the community. Christ wasn't coming from such backgrounds. He came, this expression of God was revealed to us in, in, in humble circumstances, in deeply humble circumstances, born in a manger, a very ordinary family, very ordinary background, refugee, immediately becoming a refugee, that kind of stuff. And then his constant focus on the poor, not disregarding the rich. You know, he still dined with the taxpayers and tax collectors and what have you. Um, he, he saw the Roman soldier as the one who had the greatest faith in all of Israel. He still mixed with these people, but his focus was always pulling them back to that preferential option of the poor. And then when they came to get him for it, non-violently he accepted his fate. Thy kingdom come on earth as is in heaven. That's really the nub of spiritual activism. But it's not kingdom in the worldly sense. Are you a king then, said Pilate at his trial, to which Jesus answered in John's gospel, no, well, he didn't say no, he said, king is your word. In other words, he's saying to Pilate, don't apply your construct, your patriarchal, hierarchical, power-driven construct of what it means to be a king. Don't apply that to me. If my kingdom was of this world, he said, my followers would take up arms and come to save me. But my kingdom, as I would translate it, my community of the realm, my community is not of this world. The, the Greek used for king is, or kingdom is basilica. It means a king. But what was the function of a king in that context? It was to be the personification of what holds together the people. And so, you know, I've been doing a few talks recently, um, including with um, Matt the, on English identity and where England is at. I mean, you know, we, we've done a lot of work in Scotland about our identity and you'll be aware of that. But I think that the burning need for England to recover a sense of identity and to recover the real meaning of what Blake was on about in his hymn, Jerusalem. But, so many people are not awake to that and don't understand that the recovery of an identity of the people, the recovery of the basilica of the people held together in one way, but not in the way that Hobbes envisaged in his Leviathan, but in a way that is about justice and peace holding people together. The recovery of that, I think, has got to be spiritual work. And that is, in my view, you know, the deepest work needing doing in England just now. I should say I was born in Doncaster, a mother from Birmingham. 
I was raised on the Isle of Lewis with my father being Scottish. Um, I, uh, but, you know, if, if the English side of me um, can speak, the deepest work of spiritual work in what it means to be a people, how to be of service in the world, not competitively, not aggressively, not with nuclear weapons and so on, but in people who carry peace and justice and embody that in international relations with the world. So really, folks, that's, um, <laughs> that's my take on what it can look like to do spiritual activism. And you see there how the theology, the spirituality and the applied stuff is weaving together. Thank you, Alistair. Kathy, did you have a question or a comment? Um, actually, I was just applauding. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Excellent. Any, any responses or thoughts or, you know, reactions to what Alistair's presented there? I do have a question now, I've thought about it. Um, I just, I thought that was fantastic and really interesting. I was thinking about the experience where you took the inner city Glasgow kids to the Iona Abbey and um, it, you kind of said it was very middle class and it didn't really work. How can we sort of direct ourselves so that we try and do activism in the most useful sense? <laughs> My wife are in there. Um, <laughs> um, Cassie, you said, how can we what? So how can we kind of, um, I suppose it's a question really about discernment, like how we discern the spaces where we're likely to get change because we've all got sort of limited energy and amount of yeah. amount of time. Mm. So mm. how do you go about kind of deciding that, I think? I know some things really come up naturally for us where we live mm. and that's kind of things of the spirit, but then other mm. times we kind of have to make decisions. I think, first of all, it's a slow process. You know, I, I didn't dive into this kind of stuff. I remember, and if David there being a person of color will forgive me, David, um, I was raised in a middle-class medical family context in the 1960s when most such people were naturally racist. Um, I was brought up, you know, my father, a doctor, believed that black people were less intelligent than whites and that the British Empire was a good thing and all the rest of it. And it wasn't until I went to university in 1973 that I actually encountered black people uh, almost for the first time and um, <laughs> found that they were not lacking intelligence and that they had very different values. And then I went out to Papua New Guinea in 1977. And I can remember getting there. And I, I can tell you, you know, because my psychology was not configured to looking at black faces, it is true that everybody looked the same to me. And, and I later found that they also found that white people all looked the same if our hair color was the same. You know, if you put lots of fair haired, bearded white men together, people who are not used to looking at white people will think that we all look the same. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like we have to learn by being amongst one another. Jesus spent half his time up the mountains or out in the wilderness and the other half amongst the multitudes. Um, that action and contemplation that Richard Rowe talks about. We have to be amongst one another. So I think, Kathy, you know, we have to start by exposing ourselves to situations where we get to know people um, and obvious ways, you know, volunteering in community organisations. And, you know, if we're talking about social class, then volunteer in the food bank. Uh, if we're talking about people of colour, volunteer in a refugee action group, something like that. And, and the hugely important thing, I mean, I, I'm speaking to you here from Govan. If I can just lift my camera here. Um, there's our garden outside. You can see that the factory at the back of the Victorian school. It, in the difference, the factory's fire door opens onto uh, that... Um, you can see the kind of context we're in. It's, it's, um, 
it's very much a working class community. And if somebody like me comes in and you know, tries doing the thing of saying, oh, you know, my granny was from a working class background, it, it doesn't cut ice. They, they see straight, they, you know, they look straight at somebody like me and say, yeah, you know, he's middle class and all the privilege, um, male privilege, um, cultural privilege and so on that goes with that. They see that straight away. And so what's helpful is just to acknowledge it. And so now and again, not overdoing it, you know, in a, in a context like the Gal Gale Trust, I will simply acknowledge that difference and you can feel people relax. Um, you can feel people relax. You don't virtue signal with it. You know, if, if, if I go into a, a group of people of color and start put wearing sackcloths and ashes because I'm a white person and so on, they'll sense that that's not authentic either. But if I simply acknowledge the reality of white privilege, that's enough. And, and ask people their experience. Say, what's your experience? Mm. What do you think of, you know, the, the government's recent report on race, that, that, that kind of thing. Then they start to see that you're with them. And, and then you break through, you, you know, this profound interconnectedness, this membership one of another in the spirit you then start breaking through to that common humanity. And, and, and that's when you actually start feeling the love moving. You start feeling the love flowing. So Cassie, I would say that that is how you do it. It's, it's as simple as getting onto a bus. And you know, if you see somebody who might be vulnerable for one reason or another, um, maybe you know, somebody with a handful of kids who might need a help getting off the bus, maybe a person of color, um, or somebody who's visibly Muslim, if there's recently been a terrorist attack or something of that nature. Um, you know, if you see something like that, just sitting close, but not, not too close for discomfort, but close enough to intercede if need be. Little things like that, you can just weave your activism into, you know, it ends up you can't walk down the street without saying, whoa, -ho, here's another chance to make community. You know, a friendly nod, somebody's bicycle fallen over, you just pick it up and walk on and hope that nobody thinks you knocked it over. <laughs> These things can go wrong. Um, at a bus stop, where there's a push, making sure that somebody who might be struggling can get on and doesn't push the side. All of you know, these so many things, folks, so many ways we can be activists. And, and then you think, well, who am I to do this? And you may feel a bit awkward. And, and that's where the spiritual grounding can be so important. Um, allow it to be Christ that is doing it through you. Allow it to be the Buddha nature that is expressing itself in this way. Um, embarrassment is always a sign of ego. So when you feel embarrassment, take note and say, ho, ho, there you go again. I've caught you again, ego. <laughs> rest it into you know, the Bhagavad Gita, the holy work of Hinduism, Karma Yoga. You know, it says, give over what you're doing to God. The, the Upanishads here, um, where is it? Um, I was looking at it just a, a, a day or two. Um, yeah, the, the start of the Isha Upanishad, written about the time of the same book as the old books of the of the Hebrew Bible and so-called what we non-Jews rudely call the Old Testament. Um, Behold the universe and the glory of God and all that lives and moves on earth. Let the transient find joy in the eternal. Set not your heart on another's possession. Working thus, sorry, only actions done in God bind not the soul of man. Only actions done in God bind not the soul of humankind. You know, just give it over to God. If you feel awkward about what you're doing, ask if that is the name you are doing it in. And if not, then okay. Uh, but 
then you then you see where your work needs to be done then you see where your spiritual cutting face is mm -hmm. thank you alistair it looks like david has a question or a comment both um i'll say this with a smile on my face so you know i'm joking all right uh, i don't like you alistair <laughs> <laughs> no because I, for, for a long time i'm um, i've had a problem with the song the hymn jerusalem mm. And it just get, gets my back up every time. But, mm. but, 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 but you intrigued me, challenged me just a little bit about, about this thing about identity and recapturing, uh, it, as you said, what it means to be English in this, in this context. Mm. Now, obviously, there's dangers involved in doing that. And we know where it can go with nationalism. We see what's happening in America with Christian nationalism and, and, mm. and, and all mm. of that. So how, how do we navigate that space to appreciate our identity and obviously i'm talking as a black person because whenever i bring up this thing about identity i always get thrown in my face well it says in galatians 328 that what sorry come again galatians 328 you know i said that's always thrown in my face galatians yeah. 328 where there is neither jew nor greek yeah. slave nor free neither, neither jew nor greek yeah <laughs> yeah so, so so therefore you know and, and how i interpret that is what that's saying is we should all be white <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, you see, that's what, <laughs> neither Jew nor Greek. It's um, it's saying well, we're all, we are all children of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all children of God, and you know what is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is a melting pot of of, of a city. Mm -hmm. um, in Scotland, we are blessed in that our poets, uh, poets like Robert Burns, Hamish Henderson. Um, Kareen Polworth, a modern one. Um, our, our poets have a very strong inclusive sense of national identity. Um, Hamish Henderson in the Freedom Come All Ye, ye which is um, an anthem for Scotland, has a line, you know, black and white in other Marriott, black and white will marry each other. And no more will we sail down the broomy law. No more will we sail down the river beyond that chimney I showed you there um, to, to fight imperial wars. So you know, we've, we have that. Um, it's for our that and our that. It's coming yet for our that. That man to man, the world around, shall brothers be for our that. Robert Burns. In spite of everything, it's coming yet that we will be brothers and sisters in the world. Now, in Scotland, we have chosen to very actively embrace that kind of stuff. And when I speak about the need for English people to recover an acceptable, uh, not just acceptable, but a beautiful sense of national identity, that's what I'm talking about. Mm. And did those feet on England's green and pleasant land, to which I reply, of course they did. Of course, Christ is imminent everywhere. This is about understanding that. Mm. And, you know, that is why it's not good enough when, uh, when you have the white church or when you have um, religion being used against mm. multiculturalism. Yeah. So, I mean, I think... Come, come back to me on that, David. Come back to me on that. I'm sure you've got... Oh, yeah, yeah. But, well, it ties into the second thought I was having that also what happens is, yeah, we, we have this thing and, and, and hopefully we have a right sense of pride. But then, and again, as you said earlier, that th there's this hierarchy that we're also fighting against, mm. you know, and trying to remind people, actually, what that scripture is really saying is there is no hierarchy. <laughs> We are all brothers and sisters, you know, whatever term you want to use. But then also the, the other tactic that, that is used is, again, and I think what you're saying to us is we've got to bring things together. But what a lot of Christianity, I think, does is it forces things apart and saying there is opposition. There is a difference. There is something better, you know. And as soon as you start to talk against that, they're saying, well, now you're being political. Mm -hmm. that's not the gospel that's you know all of these arguments i hear all the time and as and i think you said earlier it ties you out and you get fed up yeah, yeah. You know? I'm, look, I'm, I'm just looking for a, a minority i can't 
I don't know where I've got it. Um, the cross and the lynching tree. Oh, yeah, all right. Okay. By, by, by you Jean. like James Cohn, don't you? <laughs> uh, and, you know, the, if, if I was able to lay my hands on it, I would have just read you the final, the, the last half page of that. Mm. You'll know what it's about, David. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, oh, it's so powerful, I can't put it into words. So, where on earth have I laid it down? Um, can I just chip in? Oh, here we are, here we are, here we are. I found it. Here we are, here we are. Um, okay, and I'm just going to turn to, I mean, to me, you've just got it summed up in in, in, in this final page, 160. Oh, we've lost him. Oh, we lost him again. <laughs> Known to oh, pe two people oh, in America. Uh, you lost me again. Oh, oh. Are you back now? Are you back? Am I back? No. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's gone again now. <laughs> Am I back? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. No. Um, I'm going to switch on to another mic. I just. Um... No, you're good. You're good. We can hear you. You're back now, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, though it won't be such quite good quality. Um, no two people in America have had more violent and loving and, and loving encounters. I mean, the, the compassion of this guy is amazing. And loving encounters and black and white people. We are made brothers and sisters by the blood of the lynching tree, the blood of sexual union, the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. No gulf between blacks and whites is too great to overcome for our beauty is more enduring than our brutality. The lynching tree is a metaphor for white America's crucifixion of black people. It is a window that best reveals the religious meaning of the cross in our land. Oh, there's a theology we need here. In this sense, black people are Christ figures, not because they wanted to suffer, but because they had no choice. If America has the courage to confront the great sin and ongoing legacy of white supremacy, with repentance and reparation, there is hope beyond tragedy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, bring, let's hear that coming out of the Church of England. Oh, yeah, I'd love that. Let's hear that coming yeah. out of the Church of England. That, then we can take it seriously. So can, can I just chip in? Um, David's, you know, experience with have it, having that verse from Galatians um, thrown at him, and it, it sort of raises a really important issue, I think, about the use of scripture and um, be because really, I guess what those what those people are saying is we should be colorblind. Yeah. And I remember back in the 80s when this was thought of as a good thing, you know, and I've had to learn uh, how important it is to recognize the injustices and the privileges um, in order to put things right in society. But by raising that um, issue and how people use that text, David, I think you get to the heart of a really important point, which I learned, um, you know, uh, when, when I was at university, really, there's, you're never going to get away from the need to interpret a scripture. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, so you look back at, you know, the history of abolitionism, for instance, and some people were using the Bible to justify slavery. Others were using it to argue for abolition. Um, and there is no straightforward answer to this, you know, and people love to treat scripture as if it um, somehow that the words have an intrinsic meaning that, that can't be denied. But, but the problem is, as a person there reading those words, there's an institution there reading those words or interpreting those words whenever they're used. And of course, Jesus does it himself. That's why he gets in so much trouble. He's reinterpreting his tradition <laughs> in a way that upsets everyone and challenges orthodoxies, challenges social structures, challenges the way that um, Jews in Israel at the time interacted with the Roman Empire. So, you know, there will always be people interpreting scriptures in a way that... Um, suits the status quo and absolves them of any kind of responsibility to change or in themselves or, or in the world. But it drives you back again, for me, to this question of spiritual activism, yeah. which 
places an onus on us as, as humans to be transformed from within, you know, because there is, you know, the, the job of interpreting scripture involves becoming a person who can hear its message truly and, and, and see what these words were intended to mean or how they can be interpreted afresh in a way that's healthy in a modern context. Um, you can't get, you know, this is what Jesus is on about all the time, isn't it? So is Jeremiah, so is Ezekiel, when they talk about, you know, the word made flesh and, and, and being transformed in the heart. And it's not the, the words carved on blocks of stone. It's, um, you know, the word made flesh. So we our spirituality and our faith has to be a process that we recognize that it, that is going to challenge us and change us from within. Otherwise, what is it? Otherwise, all it's doing is giving us a little comfort zone in which to feel safe uh, and that changes nothing. That's, that's why I, lo I, I do enjoy listening to Walter Brueggemann that you quoted earlier. And, and I think there is a distinct lack, in my opinion, in the church of that prophetic imagination. Mm. You know? And I think that's probably the biggest work for me is mm -hmm. how do you get people to start to think differently? But it comes from that transformation, as you're saying. So, but I don't want to monopolize things because I could. <laughs> that was fabulous. I, I was just thinking about what Alistair was saying about this whole, the discomfort. And I think a lot of, a lot of, it for, for me personally is leaning into the discomfort rather than, I think sometimes in certain parts of the church, we're taught that that discomfort is the Holy Spirit kind of warning you, you know, that you know if it's uncomfortable, it isn't good. Mm. When actually most of the time to kind of break down the boundaries, we need to lean in and really think and consider what's going on. And is that discomfort something that I need to push past to understand more? Um, but that takes, it's like a muscle you have to work, isn't it? Does it here's, just happen naturally? A little, uh, here's a little section from the book, which maybe brings together a few things we've been talking about. Um, Gian McLeod, who um, is involved with Alistair in running the Galgale Trust, was married to Colin McLeod, who set up the Pollock Free State in the Rhodes protests in the 90s that Alistair's mentioned. And in the book, we have a, a, a number of little case studies of spiritual activists at the end of each chapter. This one um, uh, is about Gian McLeod and her work. And it describes what the Galgale Trust does. And, um, and if that passage finishes saying, Gian has to wrestle endlessly to balance people issues and project funding. But what matters most, she tells us, is spiritual bravery. Mm -hmm. Spiritual bravery, this is a quote from her now. Spiritual bravery is the willingness to go beyond what is traditionally perceived as right or wrong, so as to discern the correct action at each moment. Colin had shed loads of that kind of bravery. It ruffled a lot of feathers. But grains of truth were shaken free in the process. It means to live each moment by balancing head, heart, and hand, not by the day-to-day -day dogma that keeps you in the right, in quotations, but by, by being willing to take the risk with each step that you may be wrong. Being wrong can be a wonderful thing. It's learning, it's growth. It's the kind of vulnerability that opens up the space of solidarity. It's connection. And that perhaps you know, is, is the flip side of what Daniel, Daniel talks about there. You know, people think that feeling uncomfortable is a sign that you're going in the wrong direction. Well, perhaps Gain McLeod would suggest the opposite. You know, being uncomfortable is, like, is exactly where you should be if you, are, if you are trying to be spiritually brave. Mm. <laughs> need a moment with that one <laughs> any other thoughts and feedback from yeah. folks 
I think we should have a saying that um, send revival, Lord, send with me. I start with me. And I always think like, you know, um, the change we want to see in the world start with ourselves. And like, you know, you know, listen to lots of stuff about all those little things. You know, you know the old arc principle, isn't it? Um, uh, I think what the song, acts, of, uh, ran, acts, acts of Random Kindness, you know, where you just, you know, if we, if we can, oh, it's, I don't know, it's just a, maybe it's just a pipe dream, really. But uh, if, we, if we can, like, you know, not so much just focus on our own lives, if we start with ourselves and how we live, try and live a better, better life or, uh, you know, a life that's more, conducive to the way God wants us to live and then you know I just I just uh, may have a, have a hope and a dream that, that that then sends ripples out to other people but it's all those little things isn't it I mean like even you know occasionally my wife and I we, we go out around where I do a bit of uh, litter picking and um you know it's just those sort of things like ain't anybody could do it yeah but like you know for whatever reason you know you, you know you may want to I would say that like, God's laid it on my heart um but whatever happens so whatever you know, God's placed in you, it's probably your thing to do, not for somebody else to do. Mm. So like when you when you see something that needs to be done, um, you know, and that's the activism stuff, um, it's always great to do with other people. But if you're aware of something, you know, don't let other, other somebody, you know, don't let it, don't, don't, it's not up to other people to do it. If, if you're aware of it, then I, then I, I, I strongly believe like that's, Prompt of the Holy Spirit. To, that was another text. Uh, prompt of the Holy Spirit to um, um, to respond. Right. Yeah, that's my little bit. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> Kathy, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just was thinking about what Alistair was saying, quoting from James Cone, and what David was saying, and then how you, I think it was you said afterwards, "Is the Church of England ever going to be able to do that?" Um, and the answer, I think, is no. Unfortunately. I've had an interesting and difficult experience over the last year and a half where in a ministry course where I live in Manchester, I saw a presentation. I was talking, we were talking about this in our little group earlier um, from the guy leading the ministry course, which talked a bit about the history of the Church of England, but did the section of the history of the church in Africa without mentioning slavery, colonialism. And I was absolutely horrified by it. So I put my hand up and said, I'm sorry, that was really hard to sit through. That was a very whitewashed colonial presentation and because I did that I was thrown off the course slandered and then the vicar from my sending church wrote a public blog online outing me as a gay person yeah and I cannot get this dealt with so my take on this at the moment is I have to heal from it but I also have decided that actually as a working more working class than the very middle class church of England I take on board Alistair's thing I'm half and half really because I'm very poor but very educated <laughs> so yeah. I'm aware of like belonging in both those spaces um I think it's kind of necessary for me to work through this but also thinking about these people as being trapped in a system of empire mm. that they are so part of they actually cannot see it for themselves wow. so the immediate reaction is to deflect and pretend everything's fine I'm also in a major um, a, a church of England church that's got a major public image as an inclusive church and that is why they want to silence me so the whole thing has been kind of horrific and I reported it into the anti-racism task force going on in the church of England but what I've kind of discovered from this is like basically it hasn't even got basic equality and diversity let alone an understanding of intersectionality and so as a woman who is bi and poorer it is not a safe environment for me and so I've had to kind of accept that and think my activism needs to take place in other spaces where I can kind of draw spiritual um, succor from pl places like this actually in other places where there's more equality um, and I can kind of not bother to waste my time trying to change an institution that fundamentally I don't think is able to change. Mm. So that's what kind of what I was thinking about in terms of anger and where you put your energy, actually. I was going to say that, uh, uh, you know, you, you mentioned about anger earlier and I made a note of this and Phil said uh, he's interested in that as well. And, and absolutely, I can see why, why you're so angry, of course. Um, we have a little bit about anger in the book, um, uh, which draws on the feminist theologian Beverly Wildung Harrison. Um, she wrote an essay called The Power of Anger in the Work of Love. In the work of love. Um, 
And her concern is with the deadened nature of institutional religious life, exactly what you're talking about. She says anger, I'm reading from the book now, she says anger is not the opposite of love. It is a feeling signal that all is not well in our relation to other persons or groups or to the world around us. Anger is a mode of connectedness to others, a vivid form of caring. I think those are brilliant words. In her view, it's not anger that subverts community, but the denial of anger, because mm -hmm. it forces human relations <laughs> onto a footing of psychological dishonesty. This is, this is Beverly Wilde and Harrison in, in our book. And I find this comes up an awful lot about anger. Uh, and that's a helpful starting point, I think, thinking about anger. Of course, an anger brings m huge energy with it because from a very simple psychological point of view, it, it puts us into fight or flight mode um, of survival and, and battle. And you get this a lot in activist movements that, that anger energy is often, you know, what gives the movement its, its energy, but you've got to be very, very careful with it because it cuts off the higher thinking powers where we're able to maintain awareness of all those bigger truths about the humanity of our enemies and so forth. And, and of course, I, I think it connects directly to Jesus, probably Jesus's most astonishing words, love your enemy. And what do we do with it? How do you work through that kind of anger? Well, Jesus, you know, this is not just a side teaching, by the way, of Jesus. I read Malcolm Muggeridge in the 80s, whose interpretation of love your enemy was, uh, that must mean don't have enemies. Well, he's obviously not read it because it comes straight after Jesus saying, woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, for goodness sake. You're supposed to have enemies. If you're doing it right, you're going to have enemies. Mm. But what do you do with it? And Jesus, of course, in that passage, asks us to pray for our enemies. Now, I think there are lots of really interesting spiritual teachings about how to you know how to love your enemies how to do peace work really is what we're talking about how to challenge your enemy how to oppose your enemy how to stop them succeeding in their evil works whilst maintaining view of their their full humanity the fact that they are children of god just as much as i am and jesus's practical everyday solution his his approach is pray for your enemies now i've tried this with people and i find it fascinating you know if you have a, a group of people you ask them in that small group to identify an enemy and pray for them aloud people find it very very difficult to do they almost invariably start praying for themselves to be able to find some compassion for their enemy that's the most common thing or it gets sidetracked into a kind of, please allow my enemy to see the world the way I see it. You know, please somehow give them some kind of revelation that will stop them being bad. But I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. And certainly if you, if you look at other traditions, Buddhism, Hinduism, where similar teachings um, and practices are used, the, the tough thing is to pray for the well-being of your enemy. Now, I think if you're able to do that, if you're able to practice that, to pray for the well-being of your enemy, then that is a transformative process that changes you. It changes the way you engage in these situations. And it allows you to, to move beyond that pure sort of violent an anger energy into a space where you can maintain the tension of them being so very wrong and what they're doing being so wrong, but, but keeping in view their full humanity. Naomi has her hand up. Yeah, I was just kind of pulling, I think pulling together some of the stuff that David talks about and Kathy as well, but there's this eagerness to kind of jump to peace, even if it's a false peace, even if it's a peace where 
the same people are having to sacrifice themselves in order to to achieve it and there's that resistance to the actual transformation process that will actually get you there and will actually get justice and will actually get harmony within within people and I'm you know I'm, I'm fascinated with kind of natural transformation processes and the way that things like um this comes up again and again in in, in the world around us and the need to transform and and the power of of changing um in different ways and it's kind of got me thinking about like the different gifts that people have within this spiritual activism like um, I find it I find it interesting that obviously we have priests and and the idea of kind of leaders in in that sense in in the church but we don't have almost an equivalent to like a spirit guide and I know that that can might feel a bit kind of out there for for people but actually I'm, I'm fascinated with this idea of, of it being people's calling to to journey with people through that necessary transformation and and you know that being a calling that people can experience within this work and that being different to the people who are you know the the rabble rousers and the prophetic voices and the people who are challenging things and and making people uncomfortable so that they can start that that journey of transformation and it's just got me thinking of like the different gifts and roles that we play within this like there's not going to be one model of this is how you do activism and this is your your part in the movement we've got to work together to to create that kind of like transformative journey for people um so yeah it's just a bit of a reflection really but I think. Well, um, sorry, Alistair, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, the Bible is a very interesting place to start with for making people uncomfortable. Um, this morning, as I was getting into a space ready for this, I chanced to look something up that was in Deuteronomy 28, and I read the whole chapter. And like so many parts of the earlier part of the Bible, you know, it's a pretty horrific chapter. It starts off with a beautiful exposition of the blessings that walking in the way of God will bring to people. And then it moves into the curses that failing to do so in which God will inflict vengeance upon you until you are destroyed and so on. And you have this um, sense of this profoundly vindictive, angry, God. I also chanced this morning on a passage in um fairly typical passage in Joshua, where Joshua has gone in and he's destroyed the entire Canaanite city. He's destroyed everything except the gold, silver, bronze, and iron that he took to put into the treasure house of the Lord. Now you don't get many sermons preached on these kind of passages. But I actually think we need to start looking very closely at those kind of passages, not to edit them out and reject them, but to say these reflect a certain stage in spiritual understanding. And that those stages in spiritual understanding are not only historical in the sense of moving through the two and a half thousand years or whatever it was of history, that the Bible spans, but they are also psychological within us. There are many who would call themselves Christians whose understanding of God is of a figure that takes vengeance in a very personal way upon their enemies and who delight in those vindictive passages. But when you look at the Bible as a whole, you see this movement from a God who was basically a warrior God, represented or seen through human eyes as being integral to the violence of those times. And then it moved through into the later prophets, the beating plowshares into the, the beating of swords into plowshares. Uncle Freud always trips me up when I try to quote that one. Um, the beating of swords into plowshares so that they will learn war no more. And then you move into the full on nonviolence and lived example of it in the crucifixion in the gospel. And 
to which the violent will say, well, what's the point of that if you're just going to end up being crucified? And the point is that the whole point of spiritual teaching is that we're more than just egos on legs of meat. We are spiritual beings. The greater part of ourselves has never been born. The greater part of ourselves is rooted in eternity, not just in this fleeting moment of time. And what Jesus shows in the cross as it absorbs the violence of the world is, is a strength of love, a, a cosmic magnitude of love that lifts that reality outside of its narrow positioning in space and time and brings it into eternity. And so the crucifixion is every moment, but the resurrection is also every moment in this cosmic dance of life and death, the whole being held in that basket of love, the name of the game of which is awakening. Look and you will see, knock and it will be answered unto you. Awakening, awakening to that, to, to the joy, the, um, the ecstatic delight of it or that is the that is the movement of it but it's a movement that reflects both historically and in ourselves so one of the powers of looking at in fact i have to preach a sermon in st andrew's university um in a few weeks or months time and i mean the lectionary reading is awful it's one of those vindictive um old testament passages it's the first lectionary reading and the second one is wonderful and the, um, the chaplain said, well, you don't have to go by the lectionary. You can skip it. And I said, no, I always like, I always find great fun in the discipline. You know, fundamentalism must be fun. Um, I always find great delight in following the lectionary. I will start with that awful passage and I will use it to show the movement through to a very different understanding of spiritual life and what it can mean to be a human being. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, we're, we're just nearing the end of our time it kind of flew by. Um, it's kind of lovely to have a more intimate conversation like this. And I, this, I think others will watch it later and there'll be a lot to tease out. And um, I, I guess I want to invite everyone to just have a think about um, what next and like for you personally what is what are the kind of actions that or the next steps for you whether that's on a spiritual level or a community level or whatever um that you that you're going to take from this conversation and also if there's things that you you feel like it would be really helpful to explore more in conversations like this be really happy to hear from you um so you can I'll, I'm going to send a follow-up email. I'm hoping that um, Matt and Alistair will send me like a list of all the books that you mentioned because I just couldn't keep up. <laughs> It'd be really helpful to um, to have to send around to everybody along with the recording of this. And um, yeah, so if there, I, I'm just wondering, you know, off the back of this conversation, whether we need to do more about anger and how we process anger and forgiveness and loving your enemies. And um, it's such a complicated, multi-layered subject in a world of injustice isn't it and um and and of trauma so i think this has moved me to think a little bit more i don't know about, about you naomi about how we talk more about that um i also just want to before we finish i'm going to share my screen for a second uh we've got our next book club coming up on the 19th of june with chine mcdonald and um her new book is coming out this month, uh, God is Not a White Man. And so we'd love to have you join us for that and tell others. And it'll be um, be a good time for us to chew over some of these things in practice. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we talked a lot about anti-racism today and that's very much a heartbeat for us too, to be able to learn and grow. And, and you know, you know as, a, as a white, woman sink into the dis, you know the discomfort of what I need to learn and what I need to hear and um so anyway huge thanks to Alistair and to Matt I don't know if you have any parting parting words or phrases to folks before we say 
Kathy, what, what did you want to say? Just a very quick one. Um, please, could you just remind me who the Stations of the Cross were drawn by? I thought they were beautiful. They were amazing. Oh, um, they're by um, um, Paris Esquivel. Um, forgotten his first name. Um, Esquivel, A S Q U I V A L. And if you Google Liberation Theology Stations of the Cross, by any chance that doesn't work, just add my name, make sure you spell it right. Um, it'll come up where I have put it, I've mounted them all 15 um, on the web in several different formats, including very high resolution uh, for when people want to blow them up to do big things in the church. It's been downloaded some 30,000, well, a few years ago, it had been downloaded some 30,000 times. I don't know where it's at now. And I, I get notes from all over the world, people using them. Uh, yeah, open, they're, they're open, cop open copyright. Um, they are amazing. I mean, uh, and, and the commentaries that go with them, amazing too, yeah. Thank you. And mm. for anyone, um, I think it's like a faith-based group, isn't it? So for anyone who prays, today it was an hour ago but it will be still going on there's about a thousand people from extinction rebellion doing a rebellion of one so each of them individually is sitting in a road which oh. is pretty brave with them um, a sign on explaining why they're protesting so if you could just hold them in prayer i think that would be mm. amazing because it's such a brave thing to do mm. thanks kathy brilliant well i think I think that's where we'll finish things. Thank you so much again, Alistair and Matt, for your time. And um, I'd love to do yeah. more stuff with you. <laughs> You're great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Danielle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for holding us and for sharing with us today, folks. Mm -hmm. um, and keep up all your work. I mean, we, we hardly touched the surface, but you're, yeah. you're all clearly doing some wonderful work in your communities. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's tough work, um, but you know, keep going. Thanks, friends. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, everybody. See you again. Go well, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Have a bye. wonderful bye. day. Bye. You too. Bye, David. Bye bye. Thank you.